mic, camera, action. Who am I talking to? Oh, Terry Leather, Kevin Swain, Martin Love, Eddie Burton. Yeah, Mr. Schilling was kind enough to speak with me about this. You put Dave on the phone, eh? Well, I would, but uh, he seems a bit indisposed at the moment. Uh, what do you want? Just a couple of things from what you stole. A ledger with a dark red cover and some photos that I'm sure MI5 is interested in. The royal portfolio. Well, we got his money and jewels. And I suggest you look again. Speak to your friends. Hello? Who's this? Eddie, it's Terry. Terry. <laughs> Terry, you fucking hell. Dave's all messed up. They're they going to do the same to me. You've got to help. Listen to me, Eddie. I don't have what he wants. What? No, no, you've got to have what they want. You've got to. <laughs> you've got to help. Eddie, what am I supposed to do? You tell him we don't have it. No, Terry. Eddie, tell me you've got to help. Tell him I don't have his fucking ledger. Welcome back to the Filmography, the show dedicated to watching every credited film from an actor's complete back catalogue from past debut through to present day in chronological order. Each episode, I am joined by an esteemed guest to watch and discuss the next entry from the Focus Filmography and consider how it ranks amidst their career and whether we can trace any typecasting trends or topic traits or theatrical ticks. For episode 18, I'm joined by Big Brain Blake Biles to discuss the 18th big screen appearance of the Stath in the, based on a true story, Cockney crime caper, The Bank Job. We watch, you listen, and hopefully watch along too. So, Blake, my second episode back, so thank you so much for joining me for what is your second appearance as well. And we're yeah, discussing thanks. what I think is a more reserved entry uh, amongst the safe filmography. I don't know how you feel about it. That's interesting. Um, that's an interesting way to describe it. Speak more on that. Why would you put it like that? Because mm -hmm. I agree, but it's interesting to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, I think he's playing against type here, isn't he? He's not transporter state. He's certainly not grank state. He is not really a man of action until the final third, when we get one brief bout. And um, to begin with, he's introduced almost kind of meek and mild and easily intimidated, I suppose. Yeah, that's cool because that's something I picked up on as well. Mm. When when I listened to your first episodes of the show um, with like Lockstock and mm. those the Richie films, um. One thing that you really picked up on and that I resonated with was that he was still that kind of uh, happy chappy kind of mm. wheeler dealer, and but he was like a working class Cockney geezer type. Like he could get knocked on his ass. Mm. He was like the kind of guy you were rooting for, but he could still get knocked on his ass. And that was the kind of underdog. Mm. British kind of uh, anti-hero, you know, you kind of artful dodger that you mm. people aspire to, right? And I see, I feel like as he got into the state, the Hollywood archetype, all of a sudden he was like Tom Cruiseified, you know, like he couldn't, or, or like they say Vin Diesel or The Rock now, you know, like mm. they ca they cannot. I mean, they literally have their contracts, right? That they have to have the <laughs> equal amount of punches than screen time and that type of thing um so having him done a few of these films now it was interesting to see maybe not coincidentally it was a british film or a british based film mm. that he kind of went back to that character where he was immortal he was mm -hmm. he was not the godlike state he actually just was a mortal cockney car salesman yeah it's really welcome, isn't it? And it fits him like a glove. Like he slips 
straight back into it. You've said a lot of words there, which I've got in my notes, which as you sort of break down the film a bit, I know we don't really go in order, we jump around, don't we? But, you know, things like working class, I wrote down as well. Certainly that sense of like that, that Cockney guy, um, that back to that geezer, that guy, Richie, like geezery type. It's really heavily playing on that, isn't it? And I think, of course, it's a movie version of a, of a true story. So they're going to, glorify is not the right word like you said underdog like that sense of like play up that underdog sense of who they are i got a real kind of like almost robin hood vibe from this like you know we've been beaten down for so long and we're just fighting back for the common man for, you know particularly with the um the way that they frame them against the white privileged upper class highly educated intelligence services it was definitely what they were going yeah. for what they wanted us to what they wanted us to think about the film yeah, there was a great like dichotomy there, these binaries of the working class and the upper class in lots of different ways. The mm. the kind of crime, the corruption, you know, like you have the thugs, the the the, the gang like enforcers who mm-hmm. are kind of extorting money out of them or like loan shark enforcing or whatever at the start. And then you have the crooked Scotland Yard mm. detectives and that, you know, the the guys on the take. Um, you have the kind of working class kind of on the street Soho strip club. And then you have this elite brothel, you know, mm. but the, the um, David Suchet's character was an interesting pivot point because he owned both of those. Oh, no, he didn't, did he? He owned the strip club. And then mm-hmm. there was the madam that had the other. That's right. Those, so those different worlds was so interesting. And it was a really deliberate thing. And yeah, welcome, like you say. Um, I liked at the start. Yeah, how he was mortal. And you know what's interesting, and it's very specific to this podcast, he had more hair than he usually does. <laughs> and I wonder if I wonder if it's like a reverse Samson kind of thing. Mm. Like the more hair he has, the more human he is. <laughs> I love that idea. As a man of much hair, a, a fine mane <laughs> and a, that I'm looking at, you know, it's going in every direction. All directions. Me, I think. Absolutely, yeah. I think I can see why why you'd appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but also he had the couple that worked for him as well, the, mm. the newlyweds, and that was a really nice device to kind of give him something to care about because, like, mm. his family were there, and he kind yeah. of... Maybe we'll talk about that a bit more, but they were a bit just, like, satellites of the story, weren't they? Yeah. No, it's true. I guess it's, you know, a word that comes up a lot in the podcast that that we are all involved with amongst the comics in motion and the VHS and the Femon, this sense of kind of chosen family or found family is here in this as well, isn't it? Like that, that is his family. He's got two daughters, hasn't he? And he's got a wife, mm. Mm. but the people, his crew, they're all from his childhood, aren't they? Even um, yeah. Martin Love, the Saffron Burroughs character, right. they're That's all right. his like childhood friends and they have done separate things, but coming back together, is to show that kind of strong link they've got, isn't it? And that's that's a really good point, and it's a good time to bring up Saffron Burrow's character, Martine, mm. because she is the thread through it all. Because she, as from what I from what I gathered from the story, I just watched it last night. Um, she was someone who had grown up in that working class situation, but she had like elevated. She mm. was a model. She'd done some modelling. She was known. <laughs> A, 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 she she could move in more circles than the others could and at first I thought that it was kind of a slightly bad acting on her part but I think she the more I watched the film the more I realised she would shift her accent depending on mm-hmm. who mm-hmm. she was talking to I don't know if you yeah. picked up on that but like when she was with the MI5 fella and, and, and other people in different kind of higher class circles she would, um, you know, speak speak differently, and then She'd when she was, at, mm. yeah, upper crust. And when she was at the pub or whatever, the working men's club or whatever, she would be speaking more like the rest of them. Mm. Which is quite a classic storytelling device, isn't it? That sense of code switching for where you need to be and how, because we had that. She's manipulating the stage character. We have got to talk about his name, Terry Leather. Um, <laughs> yeah. I knew she, that would come too, up, yeah. <laughs> she too is being manipulated, isn't she, by the intelligence services? Yeah. I she's an interesting actress, Saffron Burroughs, because I first saw her in Deep Blue Sea with Tom Jane oh, and Samuel yeah. Jackson. She's like the scientist in that. But I I think this might be her first role, and she is literally a model turned actress. 
So she's right. not having to act that much, I don't think, here in terms of understanding that transition of somebody who has performed in a silent capacity to somebody who has to perform mm -hmm. in a communicative capacity. I think, you know, that's quite interesting. I think she's a little bit underrated. I, th she, I think she has the curse that a lot of really good looking people do because she is like really beautiful. You can understand why she's a, she was yeah. a model in that people yeah. focus on her looks. It's interesting, isn't it? That like you can only be, you can only be talented. At, you can only have like one gift. Mm. People's mm. minds, right? So if you're insanely good looking, you know, like as we are, we are like, <laughs> we can equally be talented in other areas. And mm. yeah, and, but especially, yeah, someone like Brad Pitt would get it right. But like, I think it's especially put on women as well. Yes. Um, at the start of the film, I wasn't really sure about her acting, but then it soon became apparent that I was feeling it about everyone. And I, mm -hmm. I feel, and I'd be interested to hear your take on this. I feel like, and uh, my wife Ali watched it with me as well. And at, at the first maybe fifteen minutes, we were like, "Hang on, what, what, what what's going on here?" Yeah, and I yeah. think it was very yeah. quick. And so I think there's an element of the direction there where you want tension, but it also felt as a viewer to be, "Hang on, what's going on?" Or oh, this is. And and maybe that forced the way that the actors were perceived because that feeling of rushness felt uh, apparent in the writing and acting as well. No, I think you're spot on. I think that's really insightful. There's way too much going on at the start of this movie because they have to establish all these tangents, don't they? I mean, the, yeah, the main through lot, line. Yeah, the main through line is this based on a true story. Like this bank job on Baker Street really did happen. Very like, I watched some behind the scenes stuff and some like actual footage of, you know, the the ham operator from the movie, the real guy was in this interview and they played some of his actual recordings of the of the the night it happened. So a lot of that is based you know, really quite truthful, particularly that middle act when they do the actual robbery. Other than the fact in real life it was three weeks and I think this was it was two days. The rest of it was pretty accurate. But um They've got all these other moving plates, haven't they? And they've got this framing device yeah. around it of the intelligence services and Michael X, who again is a real person, yeah. and some lewd photos of somebody that they keep alluding to without saying the real name. But as it turns out, was also true that Princess yeah. Margaret was photographed having a good time with men of other races, which, you know, yeah. of course is fine. But back then, it was something that's been frowned upon. But they wanted to draw these links together when really i don't you know in real life they weren't so it meant we had to show Mar michael x we had to show martine love getting arrested at the airport we had to show the intelligence services and their role we had to show the madam and the fact that she's got photos of politicians we had to show terry being as you said like accosted and threatened by the by the mm. like the, the gangsters and all of this is in five minutes it's and, the, and the strip club the, with the david suchet's mm, character mm. the pornographer with the crooked cops as well um yeah yeah and like you say it's centered around a real bank story and it, mm -hmm. it's interesting how they say based on a true story because <laughs> it's like they've taken a really kind of captivating heist mm -hmm. but then to like sex it up like literally and figuratively they've mm -hmm. drawn kind of contemporary salacious stuff from around the time just to yeah. and to its benefit i think because it is mm. a really really interesting intricate story it just takes a while to settle into i think it does all tie together doesn't it and the third act does play out actually i think is the most interesting act actually after the heist i think is the most interesting part so it does all come together it's just i agree like the first 15 maybe even 20 minutes it was a little bit like zip here and zip there and zip there and zip there and mm, here's another mm, character mm. remember their name and like we're talking about it now yeah. you only watched it yesterday i watched it three days ago i can't remember all these names already because it was yeah, yeah it was too much information it was it would benefit from a rewatch i think because once you mm. know once you've got locked in the cast of characters mm -hmm. you, and you, you can focus more on the relationships and the motivations and, and that type of thing because it was Definitely. very 
adding the, all that stuff did make it better, I think. And it was interesting, like you say about the third act, because a lot of heist films, the heist happens either early and then it's the fallout, you know, mm-hmm. like, um, and then maybe maybe there might need to be a second heist, you know, like the Italian job, for instance, you know, mm-hmm. starts off with a heist <laughs> gone wrong and blah, blah. Or it's a build up and the heist is in the third act and then off into the sunset. It felt like there was quite a bit of time after the heist in this one. And then they had to do all the wheeling and dealing. And I felt like it was positioned in a, not a bad place, but just like a, for me, like a uncommon mm, place mm-hmm. in, the, in the timeline. But because of all of the in, interested parties, you needed all of that negotiating. And mm. that uh, it was my favorite part as well. I, I do want to go back to one thing because I had said about, I wasn't sure about uh, Martin, uh, Saffron Burroughs mm-hmm. kind of acting at the start. That was soon like uh, I was convinced. But one thing that both Ellie and I noted was she uh, propositions Terry Leather mm. and he thinks about it. He comes back to her and he says, yeah, we'll do it. And there was like a flicker in her eyes. And because she's got, like you say, she's beautiful. She's got these amazing cheekbones, mm-hmm. and her kind of face just slightly falls. And you can see she's like, "I wish you didn't say yes. Mm-hmm. I wish we, I wouldn't, because she's obliged to, to to go through this, right? To yeah. kind of absolve herself of her sins. Of she gets caught sm- drug smuggling. Yeah, she's got to pull someone, and she's she's going to him." But in that little flicker, she's like, oh, I wish we weren't going down this road. Mm. And that was really nice because as it like goes on, you hear about their personal history, the kind of coulda, shoulda, wouldas, and then the mm. conflict with his wife. Um, but yeah, that was a really nice little piece of acting. It re- reminds me actually um, of a, I can't remember which movie it was, but it's from the 70s and it was um, Gene Hackman. It mm-hmm. was like one of those kind of like noirish films, and he has this like non-verbal oh, is it conversation. Goes, yeah, it'll be the conversation, and he's in the car park. The, the the female kind of counterpart talks to him, and he's just like has this moment, like maybe it was like two seconds, but it felt like a minute where he's just mm-hmm. processing it all, and he goes through five different emotions, and in that little micro expression she gave, I was like, I'm in. I've got gotcha. you. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lovely catch. That's really nice. I hadn't picked up on it, but I'd love to go back and and catch that moment. And I think it ties in with where we've come from. This idea of like perhaps she's using her is that like using her skill set. Perhaps she's underestimated. So her performance at the start. I, I mean, is the, the character within the, in the film actually is underestimated by the intelligence services people because she's playing a part for them. And then with Terry, she's playing a part. And I think. The actress, as you said, is managing to reveal these layers. She's very quick on her feet, isn't she? She'll move and change with whatever goes because she didn't really want to have to sting Terry, as you said, but she was willing to use him for her own ends. But as soon as he finds out once they're in the vault about her kind of subsidiary plan, she just switches straight away and she's on his team and they're working together. And so I think it was probably quite a complex role for her to play. And if it, you know, if it, was a debut or it certainly was very early on in her career i think it was handled very skillfully oh yeah 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 for sure um i that was a really interesting part of the story as well because very early on either that first or that second time that they met to talk about the plan in mm. the pub, terry spots the spook doesn't he mm. and so he's he's clocked onto something but he allows it to simmer, mm. doesn't it? He sees, he sees him again later, and then there's the confrontation in the vault. I feel like story-wise, for him to sit on that was really, really good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he sort of buys. She says he was chatting her up, doesn't he? He sort of buys that because I guess why wouldn't he? Because he does look at her in that way. He looks at her as this the one that got away, isn't she? Essentially, yeah. he is happily yeah. married. But um, yeah, this this is the this is the one that got away definitely. So he sort of buys that she's been chatted up, but he's also got that glint in his eye for the money, hasn't he, for the score? So I think you, as you said, you see that momentary like something's not right here. Oh, but then I'm with Martine, and actually the money, and 
yeah, it makes sense that it would go away because he's he's greedy at this point, isn't he? Yeah, but maybe there's also a confidence mm. in that if this is going to result in some shit down the line, mm-hmm. I'll deal with it when it needs to be dealt with. Because even at the start, he's a bit like a downbeaten kind of under mm. the thumb car salesman. Yeah, he really show, proves himself in the third act because the heist is actually quite a team effort, which is quite cool. Like mm-hmm. it, it, it requires Bambas, the, the demolitions kind of guy, and it yeah. requires all these different people to play a part. But he really comes into his own and being the brains and negotiating. Mm. Like later on, doesn't he? Yeah, because he's massively underestimated as well, isn't he? They think, oh, this low-level yeah. guy will yeah. will get catch him easy. They just they, they don't expect him to be able to operate in the same circles as these super smart spooks, these super smart spies. And I think it's yeah. kind of a game of people. Of it's that classic cat and mouse game, but of people being underestimated, isn't it? And that comes back to that where we started: the people you want to root for, the underdog. The they are doing a victimless crime aren't they as well really i mean that's where that robin hood thing kind of comes from these are all rich privileged people that they're robbing as well as far as we see of course there will be other people who have a yeah safe safe deposit box but the people they choose to show us are are this madam who does have these blackmail photos um and, and and people like that so we don't really mind that they're taking their money it's interesting because i during a late night wikipedia rabbit hole last night Mm -hmm. i read that like yeah a good portion of the the kind of owners of those safety deposit boxes just didn't come forward right which tells you something doesn't it yeah yeah exactly yeah and you know i think you we probably had some of the same stuff the sense you know the real robbers if you if you believe the claims that they made they did find some salacious photos and some of the stuff they left as like evidence out in the vault for the police That's to find right. when they turned up, I think they said they found some child pornography photos, which they were like, "Yeah, exactly." Oh, these are going to get left, and they're now going to get caught. And so there is almost like, yeah, like that her- that that heroic sense, and it does come right back to where you started with that kind of Britishness, that underdogness. We always like to pretend that we're we're these underdogs fighting, and th- these characters do really fit the state because that's where we saw him start. Yeah. It's actually, like, we were both really impressed. Um, Ellie wasn't supposed to sit down and watch it. She needed to get ready for work the next day. But she got and she got past that, that rush of the first 15 minutes. Mm. And then she was hooked the whole way. And, yeah, it's, I think it's um, – you know what? I think the reason why I jumped on this one – I had never seen it before. Mm. Um, I wanted to be involved in the project. Uh, I looked on, like, IMDb for some of, like, the highest rated ones. And this is, like – probably his highest rated or one of his highest mm. rated films on IMDb, you know, whatever you give that kind of currency. But um, I really rate it, man, because it takes, it takes that character from the Richie films, but it doesn't have that like high, that kind of the high octane-ness of the Richie mm-hmm. films, the, the kind of, um, it's not as masculine feeling in its no. production and its storytelling. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I do. Um, and it's a more along the line where he's got getting his chops, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I still do feel like there were some kind of emotional moments where he could have looked a bit uglier. You know, he's still like... <laughs> but, you know, he's a, he's a good-looking dude, and that's what that's his thing. He's, that's what he's banking on. But I, I do think this is the best one I've seen, and it may be one of the best I will see. <laughs> Because mm. it just fits in that perfect zone, you know. It does. I think I can. I can only come back to the word that I started with. It just feels a bit reserved, like he's holding back a little bit. And the only reviews I really found that were negative were the people who didn't like that. They wanted to see the the staith. They didn't want yeah, to see Jason right. Statham. That they wanted to see action. They wanted to see flash. They wanted to see. So some people said they found it boring. They were the only really negatives. Other than that, I think all the reviews, and you're right, the metrics on most of the the website scores, whether it's IMDb or Rotten Tomatoes or whatever it might be, are all highly favourable for this movie. I did not know in what world you could find this film boring. Mm. Like, it's it's fast-paced. Like, it's a lot of dialogue. Maybe Mm -hmm. that's why, because it's not like explosions and stuff like that. But 
um, there's just so much to go on. And it, it, it actually asks a lot of you to stay paying attention. Like yeah. a lot of good heist movies, you know? Yeah, I would not call this boring at all. No. I think something you said earlier about where the, the heist is placed is really interesting. Like it does feel like this has a real classic three-act structure, doesn't it? It's like getting the gang together and the plan, doing the heist, which is actually quite short, really. But that's kind of mm. act two. And then the fallout is the longest section and having trying to get away with it. But it, at times, it, it made me think of Inside Man. And I've discussed this movie on the podcast before, the Spike Lee movie. But I think it's because that stays with me, because I think that is an elite version of, of a kind of heist movie. And that has it right at the start. You know, it's literally probably the end of Act One is the actual heist. And then there's the, the really long section afterwards where it's like, what's going to happen next? So I don't know. I don't know if you've seen that movie and whether that sprung to mind for you as you were watching it. No, but it's, it is interesting about the pacing um, because I do feel like parts of the heist part, like you say it goes quick, but in some parts I thought it was a bit bloated in like mm. that they dwelled on details mm -hmm. that I thought because of the pacing of the rest of the film, this seemed a bit odd, but knowing, having like read a little bit about what, they do know about the heist it feels like they were like okay we're bringing in all these other like like rumored or like fabled things that happened from the time but it's centered around this crime what do we know about it and so like mm. you say like that the ham radio thing was like a big part of it and and some of what they sort of part of the conversations mm -hmm. they they included where like i feel like if you were if it was original material you might not have had some of the details. Sure. Yeah, I hear you. Because they, they want to include that because they had that as official. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Some of the cutaways to is it Eddie, I think, or to the, as you said to the, the, um, on the roof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. To cut to cut away. Yeah, it is Eddie, I think. The cutting away to to him on the roof. They were nice little moments. I yeah. but but were extraneous to what was going on, I hear you. It's like it's like for, because it's in the because I knew nothing about this one this mm. this robbery, but it's like in the cultural like zeitgeist, right? So it's like in the consciousness. So that's kind of like they wanted to acknowledge those pieces, mm. right? Yeah, definitely. Um, I really but, liked the moment when um, Terry Leather falls through into the like the crypt. Yeah. We that was we really were, cool. we we shrieked. It was like really shocking. Yeah, yeah. and and. Uh, pays off really well like it's kind of a shocking moment and then the discovery and the discussion of it being a play crypt and then the the joke of like oh i hope these aren't the last guys that were trying to rob the bank felt really yeah, organic nice like joke. statham laughs but it feels like statham laughs not terry leather yeah. laughs it's a really nice moment yeah. so i wonder if it was ad-libbed or it, 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 that whole scene i think works really well it's good that kind of camaraderie of it because Thinking about how much they would have had to have been doing that tunneling, it mm. would have been quite like it's not sexy the logistics of doing yeah. having to tunnel <laughs> through that stuff. So just no. to have a little bit of a more actual space and mm -hmm. like time space to have a bit of banter amongst the group was was needed in that moment. Mm. I think. Mm. Yeah, definitely. I think that's the it's the only bit which they they fabricated for the film as well. I believe they used explosives to get in, didn't they? Rather than... That's right, yeah. It's like a really cool tool. I want to have yeah, a lance, thermal lance. The that thermal lance, badass. yeah. So I read that they that, that they, used, they used it, but it didn't it didn't suffice to break through. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that was really cool. Um, on that, though, one of the things I found really interesting was that using that lance, and you remember how they tried out at the start with mm -hmm. Bambas, and they fall over and it's all they're all stressing out juxtapose that to I'm skipping ahead to mm -hmm. when uh, Suchet's pornographer guy captures the fella who he recognizes mm. as a, a guy who had starred yeah. one of his pornos and they use that sandblaster on him. Yeah, that's harsh. Oh, that was gruesome, man. Like you don't yeah. see anything, but isn't that cool that as a like a device to they show the sandblaster it... on like a wood wooden closet? Yes, and it just shreds away. So, as the audience, you're thinking the capacity of what it has. It show, I think it shows like a little bit, but it doesn't mm. go all the way. 
But as no, a story it, it's kind of Reservoir Dogs cutaway, isn't it? It's like it, you imagine yeah. more than you actually see, definitely. But I, I think thought, yeah, um, I thought you would like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's brilliant, and I think because it's Dave who is holding the thermal lance and drops it earlier in the scene, it makes That's sense really, that yeah. when it comes to be him later. I, I think he's he plays his character well. He's kind of the bumble of the group, isn't he? He orders yeah. chicken, the chicken and chips to go to the shop and yeah. things like that. Yeah. So I guess he and he's actually the their undoing. Doing. Yeah, he's their undoing as well because he spots Suchet's character, and mm. that's that's the start of the end. Yeah, he's the guy who was always going to go, wasn't he? How did you think that that because when the violence does come, that's a great moment to pick out, but there are a few other kind of brutal moments of violence. You've got the female agent who's gone gone over with Michael X to um i can't remember where it is he's come from from is it trinidad i think yeah yeah they go to trinidad right. and like when she gets murdered as well there are these couple of slips into these really quite brutal moments how do you think it handled those tonal shifts yeah um that's an interesting one uh so yeah her part of the story was based on a true story as well that that, that yeah. real character was uh well he was convicted of her murder let's say mm. this mm-hmm. um um that was just as an aside that little side story was like the least necessary from Agreed. our perspective like again it's like they wanted to be adding a bit of facts to, to kind of bolster to justify their base on a true story but it kind of like went nowhere and it was almost like her killing us feeling bad about her killing was worth more than the investment of building up to it yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so just to um, clarify, for, for, I guess people haven't seen it, their part of it is that Michael X has the photographs of the royal having sexy time, which we saw at the start of the movie, but we didn't know who it was. So that's why the intelligence services are after him, because he's using it as leverage, just need to get out of anything they yeah. they try to pin whole, on him. The yeah. whole bank job is to get that, to, yes. to, so he loses his strength. Yeah, yeah. Which, as again, as you said, like the some some elements of his story and his conviction are true, but I don't think he is. I don't think the bank job was done because of that and real life. I think that's been added on no, to the story. No, that's that's the way for them to bring his story. Yeah, into they've just it. grafted it. Um, on, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, as an aside, like a simultaneous mission, they have an undercover female agent. Mm. Um, infiltrating his group and to try and find any other copies of the photos That's and right, yeah. michael michael x uh it all blows up and then he he kills her um but yeah to to answer your original question it's really interesting because at that point when it all started going wrong ali was like getting really unsettled like oh i don't like this oh i don't like this part like yeah because he's like oh, i'm gonna go buy a house for my mum, and he mm. goes to see his mum. And then immediately after seeing his mummy gets picked up, right? And she was like, I don't like this anymore. And it's like, you know, with these heist things, you always need the come down and the consequence to, mm. you know, the the threat to make how are they going to escape this? You know, they escape this part, how are they going to escape the next part? Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was inevitable. I think because there's not a lot of violence in the build up, it was a kind of like a shocking shift mm. tonally mm. but good because yeah. it was like they wanted it to be shocking it, right exactly exactly mm. it, 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 it went they got what they achieved but also it showed it highlighted the muddied waters between the gangsters and the police you know the crooked mm. police mm. it's that kind of heat scenario with where you got mm-hmm. your good bad guys and your bad good guys and all that type of thing yeah and i think if i like if i remember rightly from things that i've read the same as you you know the character that is bambus and the character that is the major like those people within the crew you know they did exist and they did get killed and there is no explanation for why so whether it That's was right. through tidying up or whether it was outside agents getting them so again, yeah. that everything has a kernel of truth to it. I think is really interesting, and even if they are like shocking bats of violence, and they don't necessarily totally fit, because I think for the majority of this, it is kind of jaunty hijinks, and then suddenly you're blasting somebody's ankle off, and you're shooting them in the head ultimately, and you're 
suffocating people and then you're killing a mm, woman with mm. was it with garden was it wasn't garden shears was it when they that they killed her with ah oh, like a machete i think yeah machete yeah yeah thank you garden shears yeah. and i'm now confusing it with hot fuzz which is definitely not the same film um yeah i think i know i cut across you a little bit earlier sorry but Yes, it's shocking to watch, and yes, it's a sudden swing, but I think that's because the, the filmmakers want the audience to feel the same as the characters do in that moment. I feel like it would do a disservice to the film if mm. it were just a jaunt to the whole way, yeah. you know? Because there's got to be some gravity, and this is comes back to that little expression, that reaction that mm. Martin has when he says, yeah, we'll do it. It's kind of like they were small fry and this is the big dogs you know and yeah. so there had to be some bites to it you know mm. and it 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 adds the pressure and i'm not sure i fully saw harry under pressure you know i feel like mm. i could have gotten a bit more especially in the moment that kind of when dave was still alive and uh eddie is there saying we're gonna kill him we're gonna kill him and yeah, like I wanted to see a little bit more panic from Steve. I think mm -hmm. he was too cool. He was a bit too cool. Um, but I uh, yeah, it was it was useful. I I think and and they uh, they did it well. Like mm. it wasn't it wasn't prolonged. It wasn't massively gratuitous. No, it was a fit. It was affecting. Mm. I think they had just enough. If they had less violence, it would have felt a bit too. Um, rewarding to mm -hmm. the audience, rewarding for our like, wish fulfillment. You know that mm. we could be we could be so naughty, we could be so cavalier, and have no repercussions. Yeah, and it is in keeping with, you know, if we're going to keep coming back to Garrett. Of course, we are because it's a Stath movie. It is in keeping with Lock, Stock, and Snatch, which both do have these quite quick, sudden bouts of violence. I guess they're cartoony there. So they have a they have a different impact in a garage movie than they do here because this is based on a true story because it's ostensibly believable all the way through, really. I don't think there's any points where I didn't believe that this could be fact. It, it does have a, a higher emotional impact. Yeah. You know what? And I think the addition of those different stories helps with that because they all sound true because we've heard these stories you know the mm -hmm. Michael, Michael X the kind of spooks running around the crooked cops with the sexy Soho and all you know these paparazzi stuff and the um kind of perverse like uh, elite kind of dolphin square type stuff you know with mm -hmm. the um the elite politicians and all that type of thing it all sounds true and it all links and by bringing them all in it doesn't actually seem that convoluted and mm. in fact it strengthens the third act because okay so now he's got the photo now they want to deal with mi5 to get safe exit passports mm -hmm. and all that but there's still that risk that they're going to get rumbled mm. so by having the ledger it's they've actually had to pay a price the death of dave and all this other stuff to actually know about the ledger because it was just in the van dumped in with all the junk. This ledger of the pornographer's um, records of paying off crooked cops. So yeah. now he has this extra third kind of interaction where they're going to do a trade off there to help, like, either muddy the waters or actually a little bit of extra security to mm. get out. And I was a bit confused. You know, because the uh, the crooked cop spots the spooks in the handover, and they run off, and then it all happened in that back alley, didn't it? Mm -hmm. I was a little bit confused there about how they got nabbed, and then MI five come over and they say something to Roy Given, the, the the clean cop, and he just like lets them go. Did you catch what what happened? I there? think no. Well, I mean, I. No, and I don't think we are supposed to know exactly what, but it's part of the deal that, that Terry's made, isn't it, with with the intelligence services. They themselves say MI5, MI6, so I'm never quite clear which one it is, is which. I like that joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I think it's just that it's the deal that he's made, isn't it, that if he gives them the photo of 
what is supposed to be Princess Margaret. Um, they're free. Um, yeah, absolutely. Like you, I think they get like kind of a new identity, don't they? They get absolved. They get, and also you know they have helped bring down corruption, haven't they? In the end, so yeah, yeah. I thought that because was, because I, thought... I was just thinking like why if if Roy Given wanted to be a prick, he would just be like, yeah, you've helped us, you've helped them, yeah, but you've also done this, and we have you in our car. So I guess because you. he's a he's a by the book kind of guy, isn't he? So if somebody superior to him says we're letting these guys go, he just kind of goes with it, doesn't he? I guess. And if we track that, you know, perhaps they did leave some stuff in the in the safety deposit room in the in the bank vault as they did in real life. Perhaps they've already brought some people down and who knows? I mean, that part is certainly I know it's not a Hollywood movie, but that part is certainly given the Hollywood sheen, isn't it? Because I think in real life they did all go down for like 12 years or something. They all got, you know, they all got a decent stretch. That's right. That's right. So yeah. that bit has Hollywood eyes. And actually, I absolutely hate, I don't know how you felt, I absolutely hate the final scene yeah. of this. The, yeah. cut, the whole movie ends, doesn't it? And then the state, it cuts to some beautiful crystal clear water somewhere. The state is swimming, he's caught a fish on his spear and he pops up out of the water to his wife and daughters. I thought that bit felt very tacky and very, very cheesy. Yeah, very saccharine. And I felt mm. like, I felt like he didn't des- this is interesting actually. I hadn't really thought about it like this. He didn't deserve it. Like he worked hard for that job. He worked hard to get the future. Mm-hmm. But I don't think he deserves to have it with his family, to be honest. He certainly doesn't deserve the complete like golden sheen future, does he? Because he sleeps with Martine whilst they're in the the vault, doesn't he? And he- yeah. I- and he's also honest. just the whole risk, the whole risk he's put through. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, the whole, like, because think about once they know who he is, like the, 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 his whole family couldn't have been at risk, you know. That's true, and he but, doesn't like move. Just stay in the house, love. Just stay in the house. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, but but we need uh into the sunset kind of thing. So, what yeah. could it have? What could, if it w- wasn't for Terry Leather to finish with him? Where would it go? You know, like. Uh, would it follow Martin? Would it follow the other fella? Kevin, know? yeah. Like, Kevin. Because because that was an interesting one. We haven't mentioned that because he also had this thing with Martin, right? Mm. And he was always the kind of like hang dog, like puppy, puppy love kind of guy with her. He was actually more sympathetic character than Terry after he that was. because he had no mm. real skin in the game. Like he hadn't really done, he didn't have the problems of the family, I suppose. No, because yeah, I felt we it felt like it had a bit of a sour taste at the end. Yeah, not I agree. only because he just holds up this skewered fish. It was like you <laughs> yeah. could probably enjoy paradise without that. You know, you know when I was watching it, I watched it with my partner with Emma as well, and um, we've definitely got to talk about the the representation of women at some point before we we finish. Other than Martine, of course. I think the character of Terry, I quite like the moment when his wife calls him out and did anything happen with Martine and he just owns it and he says, yeah, it did. And I'm really sorry. And it didn't mean anything. And at least he's an, it shows that he's an honest guy and he's willing to own up to his mistakes. So I guess that's the, the get out of jail free for, for that moment. And although the state is the lead star, he's the title name and he's the guy who's behind the plan. It is really, as you said, kind of Martine's story, arguably. Yeah. Because it starts with her getting picked up in the airport and then her the minute playing Terry. So I think actually narratively it would make far more sense for that scene to have been Martine. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So it's in her going back to the airport with a suitcase and a little smile on her face and starting off on her next life. Because if you think about it, like Terry's end point there is the start of Ray Winston's life and 60 beast you know it's like sure it's yeah. like he, he's just gonna probably get back into the game somehow or, or whatever but it's like martin you they had more that they could have done with with her mm-hmm. i think there's a sequel yeah. to be told about martin there's not about terry exactly exactly mm. you're right so as it was mentioned let's talk about it buns and boobs <laughs> lots of buns and boobs in this movie yeah yeah there is it's a little bit uncomfortable for the first few minutes i'll be honest 
sitting next to the, my partner because i just I've, I've seen this once before like when it came out years and years ago and i'm no prude she's no prude you know what i mean we're, we're human we we have a child together you know we all know how that happens so i'm not you know we're not prudish about that kind of thing but i was a bit yeah. like whoa i was watching a statham caper movie this was going to be fun and suddenly yeah yeah this is really in my face yeah that took me by surprise as well um a pleasant surprise but it took me by surprise <laughs> um especially as it's a bit weird so now that i've been doing my research and kind of reading up about princess margaret like i didn't know that much like i knew she's mm. a bit of a socialite and that but to like look at that real person and especially like to see like older photos of her i think but like this is a known person and they're like insinuating not just the events but that this is her you know mm, mm. That these are these are her breasts yeah yeah but, yeah but I do think maybe there's a decision that because it's at the start of the intro, they're like frolicking in the sea. You see this uh, topless woman who we uh, yeah, is insinuated to be Princess Margaret. And then later on, there's like frolicking in a bed, mm. like a menage a trois or something like that, um, done in soft focus. Mm. And because it's focused on a photographer taking photos, which are the photos that we've been talking about. So I wonder if they felt it was less weird to show breasts first in a separate mm -hmm. incident and not show any nudity in the act. Sure. I hear you. Yeah. Um, then later on, you have the kind of pornographer strip club element. Mm -hmm. So you need to show what David Suchet is doing. And mm -hmm. um, so it was quite a lot of you have the brothel, of breasts. course, as well, don't you? And yeah. it, but it, and the brothel, it all happened yeah. to that that bit. We were talking about that like early kind of montage of all these different people. It's just kind of like, here's buns and boobs, here's more boobs, here's more boobs, here's more. Yeah, I don't know. It's just a gradual or like it just at times I don't know if it felt like it added. Yeah, no, you're right. I think that's a really nice explanation for the early part. I I like that, but the rest of it was titillation really wasn't it it was for the it sun was a, it was for it was a bit salacious in a way mm. um it showed although i mean I'm, you know I'm, I'm i'm exploring here it showed the raucousness of the kind of working man's strip club on the streets mm. of soho and mm -hmm. then it juxtaposes with this like high class brothel mm -hmm. where i don't remember the nudity so much in that because you're drawn to these elderly pasty mm. white bodies of these elderly men and do you see them again in the photos and because of the flash photography of the photos the women in their kind of leather and lingerie don't stand out as much as these writhing contorting mm. um gammon politicians <laughs> and it was ugly and beautiful in its ugliness like a turner painting um mm. where where there, there were some reasonings behind it, but I do agree that maybe on the whole, some of it was a bit like salacious or sensational. The, and yeah. One tip that I remember from the trivia was that according to Roger Donaldson, the director, mm. one of the worst days of filming was the strip club mm. because they had all of these women in lingerie, but contemporaneous to this time, most of them were shaven, which doesn't really fit. So they sure. had all these Merkins, you know, we know Merkins, <laughs> right? Like hastily made. And then they were like slipping about and just looking like rubbish. And it caused some great aggravation, apparently. So apparently for this, being a director. Yeah, this early 60-year-old man who was really struggling, I'm sure, uh, <laughs> amongst all of that. So, so perhaps, perhaps if it wasn't necessary to show that much skin, he might have mm. not had the worst day of filming in his life. No, I think it just always comes down to intention. I think you, I think you're doing more work because of who you are than what was actually in the film. I think it just kind of, all all of this stuff always now. As I've grown older, of course, and wiser, and you know, in my twenties, hooray boobs, um, which is when I would have first watched this film. But now, as a mid forties year old man, I, you know, I'm not in that place, and I think I need it to be there for a purpose. And I think, yeah, you know, yeah. you, you talked about that scene with the politicians, I think is really interesting. But I think I still feel like in that scene, we need to be judging the politicians for the way they are treating these women as objects. But I don't think the camera does that. 
and it's that male gaze yeah. it's that male gaze isn't it that we see from the director yeah. and it comes down to the director's vision for me here i think what you're doing is putting on a really interesting reading of it and i i totally hear it and i think it works much better in the later scene when we see the politician as you said in like the bsm type stuff when he's all been in leather and chains and he's like whip me harder and stuff isn't it i think it works better there but i think the even the high class scene for me felt like it was a man wanting to film attractive women for the sake of doing that yeah right right yeah there could definitely have been ways it could have been turned down for sure for sure and still and still portray what they needed it to be yeah i think so but I think I think you're right. I think you've got a really interesting reading. I think those scenes need to be there to show the sleazy side, the high end side, to show the worlds we're operating in. It's just yeah, how they choose to depict that. And you, and again, let's come back to Martine and actually um, Terry's wife as well. You know, neither of them are shot in that way. I don't think Wendy that's, isn't it? That's wife. a good point. Yeah, yeah, they're not they're not like really sexualized at all. They're they're really well put together in their costuming and, and makeup yeah. and all that type of thing like where people might not have always looked so done up mm -hmm. um like a lot of the men don't look as put together mm -hmm. um terry leather there was a lot of leather in this film but there was a lot um, of leather yeah <laughs> but um that dude could wear that leather jacket that is not not a problem for him it's interesting how mostly those two female characters are based around their relationships to the men, though, like Terry mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the other guys, you know, like yeah. uh, Martine was the one that got away, you know, regardless to, of like her just living her life, having her own struggles and that type of thing. Yeah. There was a brief interaction between Martine and Wendy, wasn't there, at the end. Yes. And it felt like it, had a potential for a bit of potency, but mm -hmm. it almost felt a bit throwaway. Like she, Martin says something to the effect of, uh, "If I could, I asked him to run away with me, and if he would, I would have wouldn't have given you a second thought." Basically, mm. which was a bold line. It was like, yeah, quite cool, but like I felt like it was not given the time that mm -hmm. it could have had mm -hmm. to 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 balance out the relationship dynamics a bit a bit more. Yeah, it was. I, I agree, agreed. I thought it was a well handled moment in terms of the actresses and how they did that scene. But again, I think you just said something really interesting there, only in order to come back to Terry's story. Yeah, yeah. Because then Martine comes, leaves Wendy, gives Terry the kiss goodbye, which again, ballsy move, but. Yeah, <laughs> and then and 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 then Terry and Wendy like look at each other and give them each other like the, the nod. Like she's like, oh, all is forgiven, kind of thing you know absolutely yeah so yeah, yeah again like you say yeah it, it circles back to enables terry to be that kind of guffawing guy in the water and his lovely beautiful family gazing adoringly at him in, in the final scene mm. it's just a cliche isn't it like all the, the brothels and the strip clubs they're a cliche that i think i can i can do without now like i get it like sleazy men go to sleazy places Show me the outside of it. That's actually enough for me. I know what goes on behind there. You know, I've seen it in movies. Yeah. I've been yeah. on stag do's. Um, I've spent, unfortunately, some time in that world. Never enjoyable. Always uncomfortable. So, yeah, I don't know. I think unless it's got a specific dramatic purpose, I just, you know, it, it feels a bit, it's another area that feels cliche and feels like just could have been done a bit better, I think, for me. One thing I will say about that is that I think that Suchet's character was an interesting um, linchpin between the worlds mm. um, of that kind of high class, low class, and that because like, he's mm -hmm. he's dealing with the corruption up high, he's dealing with the people on the street, um, and I think the fact that that film was talking about corruption and like sexual deviancy and mm, mm. um all that like in the kind of upper echelons of society politicians and uh the landed gentry and all that i think that was a really good aspect to have in it because like yeah. you say in the real story they apparently they in the real crime they they, they left the photos of uh, uh you know allegedly they left the photos of uh, a politician 
uh, abusing a child or something like that. So it's kind of like the working class folks are like, this is fucked up. Mm. We don't need this, but we'll leave it here so you guys can deal with it. And the tragic, the tragedy is, and this is another thing that the film brings in, this thing about called the D-notice. I, I never mm-hmm. heard of the D-notice mm-hmm. before. No, that is either. where the, the higher-ups, the MO5 or the royals or whoever, I guess, who has the power, can put like a, a injunction on the press, like to silence the press, like kill this story. We do not want this story. Mm-hmm. And, you know, sadly, these things come up, you know, Dolphin Square and all these like abuses oh. of power come up all the time and then they just kind of drift away and we start talking about migrant boats and that type of thing instead, yeah. you know? And so in some ways, I can forgive elements, salacious elements of this film hmm. because they're talking about something that should actually be discussed a bit more. I mean, it remains relevant, doesn't it? I mean, <laughs> you know, royals abusing their power. It feels like that's still somewhat relevant now in 2023. Couldn't possibly mm-hmm. say why. Mm-hmm. Um, the Stath. Let's come back to the Stath a little bit. So he, we've said like he's a bit more reserved. We liked his performance by and large in this. He said um, he can wear a leather coat very nicely. I think for me, like p- partly seeing him come back to this world is feeling that kind of cadence and his line delivery in this just feels like. Oh, this sort of, you know, like that warm blanket feeling. It's, you know, the state is back where he should be. As much as I love him being, you know, the action guy too. But there's just something, almost every line at times had me like, uh, you know, like butterflies in my tummy or just feeling happy. I could, f- I could feel M next to me being like, oh, yeah, there he goes again. Like, oh. and he's <laughs> off with the state again. Yeah. Yeah, there's a musicality to it, I think. Um, the way he talks and... That kind of yeah, the it's the accent, it's the kind of graveliness, that's the it's the rhythm, and it's it makes it really it really kind of typifies that underdog character that we're talking about because it's like he sounds like a like a person of like the streets, like a working class and that type of thing, mm. but the musicality of it gives it like he's he's up, he's ready to go, he's a bit of a blagger. Um, Speaking of blaggers, just another little bit of trivia off to the side. I I I read that the writers of this also wrote wrote Alfredo Saint Pet, mm. and the 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 name Terry was it Terry Leather was the connection. Oh, yeah, yeah. They had a character in Alfredo Saint Pet for Terry Leather, who was this ex con or whatever. We're done on this, but I just wanted to, I just thought about it because Alfredo Saint Pet is the favorite show of. Uh, another blagger, our good friend uh, Chris, <laughs> Chris Phelps from the VHS Strokes Back. So I just, the, I, the, the 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 connection there, I couldn't pass up. So yeah, I love it. It's like six degrees of Chris Phelps. Absolutely, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I I like him. Like I said earlier, this for me is like the key point statement. He's mm. still got his. He's still got his foot in that kind of. Streets of East London, Terry Lever kind of world where he um, he's a little bit uh, infallible. He's got a little bit of weakness, but he's going to rise to the occasion. But he has also that charisma, the confidence, and the he can you know swing his fists a bit and charm the ladies as he does in the uh, you know, the Hollywood stuff. Mm. Well. Yeah, it's true. I don't think we see this state enough nowadays. I think he's too. He's risen to a, a place now, hasn't he? Because of the fast movies and even something like the Meg, perhaps, you know, these, again, as much as I enjoy him and all of those, and I like all those films, he's risen to a place now where perhaps it's difficult for him to step back into that role again a little bit. Yeah. There's more box sticking with those kind of franchisey big marquee movies, you know, where mm-hmm. you, people go to them because they expect X, Y, Z, you know, yeah. whereas this felt, reminiscent of other films they've done because of the world but it felt more a, original character in a mm. way you know mm-hmm. i do what did you think about the moment he gets to bust out some action so it's right yeah. in the end, isn't it? it's in the alleyway and the handoff as you said hasn't gone well the corrupt cops have legged it and they've got his 
They've got what well, he loses his little satchel thing, doesn't he? Which has got that's the, right, that's right. We've got the we've got the ledger and stuff the ledger, and, and yeah. so he goes after them and his passports. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It was good, and it was actually like you mentioned earlier uh, about how late it came. It, it was that point where I was like, "Hang on, wow, we actually haven't seen anything like this mm. until now." I think it was handled really well. I feel like it was very. The choreography was good. The it was filmed well. It was filmed in that western style where you always cut. You know, you, you they make the swing and then it cuts to the impact. Yeah, cut on the. Unlike, head, that, yeah. that, unlike that kind of Hong Kong stuff where you see it all. Um, yeah. So it's of course it's going to be be filmed like that, but it was done very well. It was a very brief period of time. Um, he said he looked strong. He looked like he was going for it. Um, I just. From a personal standpoint, I've had kidney stones before, so I was actually really <laughs> feeling for Sashay's character. Mr. Sashay's like in the build-up, he's like feeling, "Oh, my kidney stones!" and he's popping yeah. his painkillers. And so when he's doubled over and he's getting like picked in the guts and that, I was just like, "Oh, oh no!" So my my allegiance kind of shifted a little bit at that point. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> I hear you. What do you think? I loved it because, of course, we do. We love it, and then he kicks a brick out the wall, doesn't he? Which is a cool that moment. That was he's that was that cool. Brick. That was cool. Yeah. I just wonder whether really is it in keeping with is that that's the state that's not Terry Leather. I think right, really right. it should have been a more street brawl, rough fisty cuffs. It was you know kind yeah. of skilled martial artist, which you know we forgive and we and because we love seeing it. But really, it was it's a bit. It was out, slick, yeah. Get out of character. It was slick. I think um, maybe we needed to see something beforehand, like mm-hmm. a hint. If he'd done that with um, the the heavies that came at the start, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. That's, like, no, that's I've chosen. I've chosen not to do that in my life anymore. I've chosen not to do that because I've because of my family. I'm not. Yeah. That would have worked. Because they visit. Better. They visit twice, I think, or three times. But maybe if they they come early, they rough him up or whatever, and he goes by. Had to come back a second time. Had he got a little bit involved, mm. then we would see he was capable. But it would also be like it would also show, oh, shit, he's actually running out of options here. Mm-hmm. Like, like because he's, not only is he failing to pay his debt, he's now messed with the enforcers, even more motivation to go on this crazy yeah. uh, heist. And, and then, and then we've, we've, out. Yeah. we've had a taste, and then it makes more mm. sense later on. Yeah, no, you're right. It was slick. I think by that point in the movie, I was happy for it to be wrapped up. Yeah, um, you're bought the in, and yeah, yeah. The, the 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 brick thing was a cool idea though, because you do think, how is he going to get out of this one? Because that's interesting that even the fact that we think, oh, lucky he got that brick, because otherwise he might have been bugging. Mm-hmm. Hollywood Stath, we wouldn't yeah, have yeah. even had that thought, right? Yeah. So that even that that there goes to show that Terry Leather is still human to us, because mm-hmm. we think, oh, well, well done. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I thought there was some really interesting stuff spoken about, like behind the scenes. That um, Roger Donaldson, the director, he described the state as an English version of Steve McQueen. So I think he'd said it about him, and then I saw a press junk. I watched a bit of a press junket where the interviewer said it to Jason Statham, and there was such a sweet little moment of his little face was like. Oh, that is a comparison I'm so happy with. You could just see he was like a child would yeah. be like, oh yes, that but yeah, it takes awesome. me back to my first podcast where like we discussed the people his who were potential influences on him and his performance yeah. and who loved to watch in the movies. And this was That's one of right. the people. That's so cool that because I haven't read that. It's so cool that he was unable to contain his coolness, you know. Like, Absolutely. He was he, he couldn't keep cool and be like kind of fanboying out about that. Um, and yeah, it's interesting you say that because uh, the poster is really cool. Mm. And that's real Steve McQueen vibes, isn't it? It's like very, leaning out of the cool car poster. window, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Does I think that's bullet, probably what actually. they're going for. Yeah. yeah, yeah, bullet, that's it, exactly. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And I think that all the way through, you've been making these kind of like stoic leading man comparisons. And that's clearly you know, that's one that he's clearly very happy with. Yeah, it's a lovely moment because then in that same interview, a question is asked about this film and what he's got coming up, and he's just like, "I'm just happy to be working. I just, you know, 
and it's something again that I've noticed about him. He just he just lo- seems to love his job. It's just yeah, he has a good time. As an aside, isn't that cool? That poster. Like I watched a, f- a, a little YouTube video the other day about how the art of the po- the movie poster is dying, mm. and how like mm-hmm. these days with all these superhero films and all these types of things it's like floating heads and... basically like floating heads and like you go back to the old artwork of you know the 70s and 80s and that uh, the juice street and, and all that kind of stuff yeah that's right and that this bank job is like such a beautiful nod back to that time yeah much nicer than my horrible dvd cover i've got which has been made to look like a tabloid newspaper i don't know if you've seen <laughs> that version of it it's horrible no. yeah Put it on the Discord later on, so I can. Yeah, I'll send it to you. But oh, and also has like, it's got like the red banners in it. One of the titles is something like Royal Court in, you know, like, I can't think what word they would use. Royal Court, I'm not headline writer, you know, in compromising position or something. The Royal Court is about to get livid. Yeah, Joe. Yeah, exactly. But I would like to have found that in the film actually, because that's an important plot point in the movie. I don't need it on the DVD cover or on the poster. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So Terry Leather, fantastic. Where do you think it stands in the ranking of good Jason Statham character names? Well, see, so I haven't uh, seen that many. Uh, so give me a few. Give me a few off the top of your head. So you and I did the one together, mm-hmm. and he was Evan Funch in that. Where does you know? Let's let so Leather Leather beats Funch. Yeah. Uh, Crank, I think, is probably that. The best, so we'll save that till last. I don't know if you can remember. Yeah, 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 I do. Yeah, is it Chev Chelios? Is that yeah, right? Chev Chelios is crank, which I think yeah. is probably one of the best character names of all time. Um, so it's hard to beat. He's Deckard Shaw in the Fast movies, which is a pretty damn cool name as well. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit too cool though. Too cool. Okay. I feel like Terry Leather again. I'm gonna. I'm. I'm. I'm, ba- I'm banking on the bank job here. Terry Leather is the perfect Statham name because mm-hmm. it kind of sounds cool, but it also kind of sounds like a soap in your great aunt's house. <laughs> sure. You know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, like it was it Imperial Leather and like, you know, like Terry Cloth, mm-hmm. you know, like Terry yeah. Towling. Yeah. So it's like, sounds kind of cool, but the more you think about it, the more naff it sounds. So, yeah. It's the, it's the best of both worlds. It's the best of both I hear worlds. You. Yeah, yeah. That's probably true. So, so what you're saying is Terry, Terry Leather is the best Jason Statham character name I'm, as I'm far as you're aware. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll have to see. We'll have to see if there's any other competitors out there. We've got the Expendables Lee Christmas to come as well. So, well, that's that's uh, that's a good one. Any any kind of because it's like Lloyd Christmas, right? That's yeah, it's a good one. Yeah. And speaking of Expendables, there's a moment in this movie actually when he says, um, like something like, "We are expendable." And I just thought, oh, fucking hell, like anachronistically, that's hilarious now to hear him say that a few years before he's got that role. And it sounds like he's going to inherit the lead now, according to, you know, the promos for the new Expendables. Yeah, right. I mean, the completest that I know you are, I Mm -hmm. probably shouldn't suggest that you go through and find every example of an actor anachronistically saying the title of a film before they were in it. That's a great project. That is, isn't it? <laughs> Somebody must have done that already out there on YouTube somewhere. <laughs> but it really jarred me out for a minute. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, it's that's fun. Yeah, yeah. It's like when you spot, you know, when they when they put in the title of the movie, when a character says the title of the movie. It's, it's a bit like yeah. that, isn't it? Like, oh, okay. Yeah, fun. Oh, uh, there it is. There it is. Yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. Which, of course, um, Dave picked the best one, didn't he, the other day on VHS when he picked... Um, Deathstalker too, yeah. Yeah, and right? the woman, yeah. woman's right. yeah, and the, and the woman delivers the line, but it's like T O O, like I will get, right. I will get Deathstalker too, and it's brilliant. And then it's like, damn, the title, beautiful, so moment. good, yeah. So good. <laughs> we all like it when the uh, when the title is mentioned in the in the movie. This is a pretty successful movie for the state, I have to say. Looking at the the budget to box office ratio, so we've said like the the ratings are good. This cost, according to, you know, you never know how much the truth is in some of these figures, but cost 20 million, which sounds about right for, I think, the film we watched, but made 66 million. So this is a pretty yeah. sizable return, I think. 
for this this mid range movie, they must have been pretty happy with that return. I think. I think it's good. I think um, I was surprised to read that the corn the bank corner was done at Pinewood. Mm. Um, very good, very spacious, very convincing. Mm. Um, they did a few location shots. They did some tube stations took the place of different ones because of upgrades, yeah. you know, to upgrade nice, yeah. Um I there were a lot of actors that I recognized, but there weren't like huge mm. names that would blow the budget up, I don't think. I can't no, remember, maybe. True. Um but it's it's interesting about the drawer, isn't it? Because it's like who do you think would go to the cinema to see this? Because mm. I love I love heist films. I love period things like this and like the, the the time period fits the highest genre all of that like we talked about the conversation earlier that, that kind of era of film um but like these days you know with the kind of oversaturation of superhero films and all those types of things this film feels like a very mature film mm, you it's know? True. so from a cinema from a cinema going perspective I I feel like I wonder if had this film been released 20, 30 years earlier, mm-hmm. could it have made more, you know, like adjusted for inflation? Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean it wouldn't get released in the cinema now, would it? This would be a direct to stream. It would, wouldn't it? And it's yeah, no kind doubt. of depressing to think about. Because it's a fantastic film. Yeah. You only get the the big budget, don't you? The big budget. And you get the, you know, the well-backed indies now really that's what you get in cinemas isn't it this is that mid-range which seems to have dropped out of cinemas completely yeah no, this is a, a netflix amazon prime mm. kind of deal yeah yeah this is a this is an original that you'd watch and stream at home yeah absolutely which from my perspective like i can hardly get time to go to the cinema these days but i feel it is very um lovingly cinematic you know mm-hmm. like i feel like Roger Donaldson and his team mm. have gone to make a cinematic heist, you know, like a cinematic film, you know, like very, very like homaging mm-hmm. heist films, seventies, British yes. gangster films, all of those things, you know. I like so that. So it, it, it deserves that stay, you know. Yeah, I think you're, it's it's a cine literate movie, isn't it? And I think it's probably quite a peak on a lot of the people behind the scenes. I mean. Yeah, the writers, uh, is it Francis and Lafrenet, or I may have got that mixed up the wrong way, but, you know, they've been successful on TV. You said uh, Clement and Lafrenet, sorry. Yeah, they've been successful on TV, but haven't had big success at, at the cinema, I don't think, in the movies. Like Donaldson had earlier success, and but not really much after this. I really like the score for this. I thought, you know, look up the composer, like who did the score, and it's a name I don't recognise, and again, has had some success in TV, some stuff in the 90s. Wayne's World and California or Encino Man, depending on where you're from. But yeah, this was felt like a good moment for all of them, I think. Yeah. Not to be repeated, sadly, really. I feel like when you're at the cinema like that and it's such a conscious effort and to see a film like this, you would come away happy. I feel like on the, on the surface, had you not looked into it anymore, it might get lost amongst mm. the streaming options, you know? Mm. And especially, like, I mean, it's a cool poster, but in some ways it's like you don't really know what you're getting. It's not really that indicative of the film, even though no. it's a very cool poster. Yeah. Like, it kind of looks like, yeah, like a bullet, like it's going to be, like, Drive or something yeah, like, like that. Yeah, like a wheel know? man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, I'm glad I've seen it. I'm, I'm really glad I've seen it, yeah. Yeah, and that's good because obviously, as you said, it's a first watch for you and you took a risk on a pick. So I'm glad it worked out. Yeah. Some letterbox reviews before I get your final word? Please, please. Have you come armed with any today? No, I didn't have time. You've been I was, too busy. I was yeah. thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would have loved to. So, um, but even so, I'm I'm waiting to hear it fresh. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Good. All right. So... Tom Marinara, I think I said his name right. He says the ideal would have been Jason Statham dragging a giant safe through the streets of London, but this is pretty damn good too. 
which I, you know, I'm, I think he's amalgamating fast five and I can, I can see that like Samson, as you said, Samson, like Stace, like, Ooh, come on. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Right. I don't, I don't get the fast five reference with the Stace, but so, yeah, it's a bit of a, have weird you not one. seen fast five? No, I haven't. I've only seen like the first two. So, okay. So the climax of that is quite literally them using fast cars to pull a, pull a safe through the streets of Rio. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm glad this film landed. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Sorry, <Yeah>. Mr. Marinara. <laughs> yeah. Nice idea, but but not for Blake. <laughs> Bridget says, okay. The thing about Jason Statham for me is I love him. I think he's compelling. Me too, Bridget. Me too. Not so much a review mm -hmm. of the film, but I mean it was a good review of the state, so I wanted to include it. Uh, Ghostman says, a compelling caper with some interesting twists. The bank job is a solid vehicle for Jason Statham to flex his acting muscles. Here, he does what every British actor loves to do, to play a gangster. And Statham, as everyone already knows, is very capable of that. What makes the bank job stand out is how it allows for Statham to deepen this archetype of his and to play to more complex emotions than what he's usually asked for. Although there's a subplot regarding black leftists that could have been handled better, overall the bank job is entertaining and a skilled heist pitcher, with some interesting surprises regarding the intersection of organised crime, corrupt law enforcement, and the British royalty. Yeah, well, that's, that's a pretty spot-on uh, record of it, I think. Um... Second use of compelling, and I think I agree, it's a very compelling tale. Um, I like this idea that they've put about the mythology of the British gangster, which is mm. something we've kind of alluded to a bit. Uh, it's interesting to hear their take on Statham as that. Um, and that's something I didn't, we didn't really talk about that much. I, I would have liked to have done a bit more research because I don't know that much about Michael X, Michael DeSantis, I think is the name. Nice. Um, but I. I would recommend anyone to watch uh, Adam Curtis's Can't Get You Out of My Head, I think it's called, mm -hmm. which is on B BBC and it's on YouTube, I think, uh, which features Michael X on there. And um, I felt from just the fact that I know he was associated with like Black Panthers and kind of those kind of movements on the left, I felt like the way he was portrayed, just based on my rudimentary knowledge of mm. him and the, that movement, uh, was it felt a bit um, against the rest of the tone of the film of kind of feeling a bit for the people because yeah, it was anti-elitist, it was mm. anti kind of this corruption and all that type of thing. It was more this Robin Hood thing which mm -hmm. I might say was leaning more to the left. And from what I kind of know, uh, Michael DeSantis, M Michael X, and uh, the Black Panther kind of movement, and all that was more to the left. And so he was seen to be more this kind of despot, you know, mm. like a yeah. Esc Escobarian kind of character. Mm. Yeah. Um, so I couldn't, I couldn't fully comment on it, but that was a vibe I got from the film. So I'm glad mm. that someone's, pointed it out yeah it was very broad strokes wasn't it there was no subtlety to his element of the story at all that's right hmm. uh lou shoemaker loosely based the man. the man one day i'm gonna have to tap him i've still got one film actually i haven't got anybody that's signed up for so maybe that maybe the time will come yeah reach out reach out Loosely based on an already loosely imagined conspiracy involving London thugs and Princess Margaret, the bank job is a little fun and a little little. The film revolves around a group of small-time crooks led by Statham who get roped into stealing blackmail photos of Princess Margaret at the behest of MI5. The poster for the film promises a retro cool crime drama, but the film itself doesn't commit hard enough to the 70s aesthetic or the outlandish plot and winds up feeling slight. Statham is excellent and really wears the hell out of his various 70s outfits, but he's about a thousand times too cool for the movie. He's supposed to be a strictly small-time hoodlum who gets in over his head, but his stony exterior and badass charisma make it hard to believe anyone in this movie could intimidate or even surprise him. 
Mm. Interesting, Lou. Yeah, mm. I I didn't agree with all of the first half of his review, but no. I think that is the difference with the previous person. I suspect the previous person might be British. And from what I know of our man Lou is uh, American or North American. Yeah, I believe um, so. So maybe it's just a less understanding of the culture here of the time, which mm-hmm. for me, I felt like it was quite well positioned in the 70s vibe. Um, but I do agree with his fact that um, Statham could have been more in the character of the everyman. While mm-hmm. I like th- while I like he was more that than he is in some of the flashier films, there were times when he did still feel a bit impervious. Like mm. he was a bit and I've I've mentioned it earlier, like he was a bit too unflappable or he could have shown a bit more fragility when his wife confronted him and that type of thing. So yeah. yeah so- some some yes, some no. But, Fair. Yeah. All right, last one. Leighton Trent says, impressive heist flick. Donaldson takes control immediately of the film. You can tell it's his vision. His direction is sharp, crisp and engaging. The film is well cast and it's wonderful how the narrative starts out broadly and comes together in the aftermath of the heist. Statham proves himself as a leading man. Yeah. That's yeah. good. Nice, n- nice nod to Donaldson because I do feel like at the start it felt a bit shaky, but mm-hmm. the more you watch it, the more you wa- you see that this is uh, uh, helmed by someone who knows how to make films. Yeah, he's a pro by this point. He's been around for a long time. Yeah. 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 All right. So last time you were on was the one quite a few episodes ago. And I think that was episode four and this is episode 18. And you decided that the one was a classic amongst the safe filmography. So are you going to keep your run going? Is this a classic? Is it worth catching? Or is it for completists only? Oh, it's not for completists only. It's mm-hmm. definitely worth watching. I would say it's a classic in that it's a very good film. And Statham is good in it. But I've got a caveat. I think if you want to watch <laughs> it just as a film goer, mm. then you should watch it. But it's interesting, and it's an indicative in one of those reviews that's like, it's not the state that people know today. Yeah. So if you were there like for that, it might feel a bit provincial. You know, Mm -hmm. it might feel a bit ho-hum. He's not quite giving what people have have putting their bums in the seats for. Yeah. Um, I want to say classic. I'm edging on... No, fuck it. I'm going classic. I'm going classic. (laughs) It's your decision. What about you? Fuck it. What about you, though? But that's that's from my perspective. But That's that's the only one that matters. This is the most... Looking at the timeline now, this is the like the most recent film I've seen of his. So that whole journey that mm. you, you you've already been on, I can't speak so much for that. But mm-hmm. from my perspective, I'm glad I've seen this film, regardless of the fact that Statham's in it. So as yeah. a Statham movie, I think it's a it's a classic. What yeah. what about you though? I think that's the only rating we need, mate. That's the only rating. I think um yeah. I think I put it in worth catching only because of what you said in that I don't think it's not a great leap forward, which, you know, I think you made a great case of arguing. I wouldn't have put the one as a classic, but I think you made a great case of arguing why it was. It was that first time we got to see that first breakout for him that I think this offers a kind of a look back as well as a look forward in that he's a safe bet to to lead a movie now because he's got this skill set but also remember this is where he came from. So that's probably why. I wonder who who might you position in this role if it wasn't the staff? Mm. Like, not to say that it's not possible. Mm-hmm. Clive Owen? Yeah, someone like a good that, shout. You know? Yeah. Um, what kind of film might that have been, you know? Like, yeah. I feel like it's not necessarily 
this is it. I think this is why maybe I I would almost go into the worth catching is that while he's a leading man in it and he's a, he's good at it, I don't feel like it's really a stath the stath kind of film. No, because someone else could have done this and it could have been a still a good film. Mm-hmm. Um, he does well. He looks good in it. He does everything right. He could have done a little bit more here and there. Um, but as the stath. Uh, it's not quite that, but personally, that's why I think this is one of the best Dave films mm, because mm. It, it's a one foot in this world, one foot in the other. So maybe it's a worth catching Stath movie, but a classic Jason Statham movie. There we go. I've, I don't <laughs> want. I don't want to start branching out these different things for you, <laughs> but um, that's where I would put it. That's where I would put yeah. It. yeah. No, I think I think that's. I think we've we've come to that organically together. Cool. Brilliant, mate. Thank you so much. You're a busy man in real life. And I believe you've got some things coming up in the podcasting realm as well that um you can tell people about to catch you talking elsewhere. So I know we're recording today, but we are not going to release until the 10th of July. So a little bit ahead. But you've got some stuff come up come up with our good friend Tony Farina, I believe. Yeah, so we have he, uh, our good friend Tony Farina, does the indie comic Spotlight, um, which we've both been on. Um, I've done um, some Craig Thompson comics with him, and we started a Tintin series. Um, mm. We've done the first two that aren't really in the in the kind of main realm of Tintin now. Uh, Tintin in the land of the Soviets, Tintin in the Congo, um, both very problematic in mm. a way as maybe the the future ones will be as well but these ones are so much that they aren't really included um we covered those two and we're looking to do tintin in america very soon um mm, right and yeah yeah that'd be cool um i've recently done uh where i'm from with yes yeah um with our friend ellison uh on, on instagram and yeah or just all throughout the kind of comics in motion um podcast group yeah you find me there once you're in you're in there's no escaping that's it that's it you're stuck in the vault with us now <laughs> thank you mate and thank you everyone for listening and partaking in this journey with me through this day's filmography that was the bank job and next up in a fortnight is death race with published author now tony farina followed by transporter three with the rule breaker spider dan for anyone that is watching along. I've been I'm Jack's Musings, and that's J-A-C-S, and you can find me on Twitter, where I am most active. You can also contact the show directly on Twitter under the name Back to the Filmog. Make sure you use the hashtag Follow the Filmography. As Blake and I have discussed, I'm also a proud member of the Comics Emotion family, a super place full of the world's greatest people, dedicated to bringing you podcasts on a variety of geeky topics. So please make sure you take the time to search, subscribe, and rate our shows whenever and wherever you listen. Until next time, be excellent to each other and make sure you take the time to treat yourself too. I am Jack signing off. Yippee-ki-yay, movie lovers.